homeschool. This is Katie at Kentucky Hemp Works. I am kind of extra excited to talk to everybody today because uh, what I was thinking was maybe we'd have more of a conversation. Um, I wanted to share some of the books that are my favorite books uh, that I've read over the years. And, um, and then, you know, also give an opportunity for anybody else to kind of chime in. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, let me know if you, if there's anything that you would like me to talk about on Hemp Homeschool, if there's any kind of like burning issues that you really want to cover. I think the only thing that I really don't want to go too far in on this series is really in-depth stuff on cannabinoids because I think it's a little more upper level and I want to keep things not simple but accessible and um, make that knowledge accessible for a lot of different generations so kids can enjoy it, adults can enjoy it, enjoy it. And there's so much good information about cannabinoids out there on the internet anyway that um, I don't feel like I need to reinvent the wheel there. Um, so yeah, so today I grabbed some of my favorite books uh, from over the years and there are definitely a lot more really wonderful hemp books out here, out, out there in the world. Um, I grabbed some of my favorites. Some of them have sort of sentimental reasons that they're my favorite. Um, other ones are sort of industry-wide. You know, we know that this is the, the holy grail of hemp books or maybe one of the ones that kicked it off and started it all. Um, but, uh, but all of the books can focus on different aspects of hemp, whether it's um, actual plant physiology and learning about the plant itself or whether it's learning about the history of the plant or whether it's learning about the politics in the early 1900s um, through World War II, the politics that went on around that time. And some of them are more about the politics that went on in the last 20 or 30 years in uh, Kentucky or, or other, other, um, other places. So, um, so some of the books, you know, if you're interested, most of them can be found on Amazon. I know everybody's looking for stuff to do right now while we're kind of stuck at home. Um, so if you can't order the book, I know that uh, Audible is doing free trials right now. So if there's anything that you wanted to listen to that's on Audible, you might be able to find some free trials. And there are a lot of freebies going around from different businesses these days um, where businesses are trying to give back during some really hard times. So you might want to check those out. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I didn't really decide what kind, what order I wanted to talk about the books, but I think that I probably should start with uh, The Emperor Wears No Clothes because it is such, um, it's such a, it's such a part of the hemp industry now. You would be hard pressed to find a hempster somewhere who's not heard of this book or read this book um, or bought copies of this book for their friends and gave it away to other people. Um, this book is, is uh, it's written by Jack Herer. And um, you know, it's, called, it's referred to here on the cover as the original hemp Bible. So the emperor wears no clothes was kind of really what kicked off the um, what kicked off the I would say the real effective advocacy and activism towards legalizing hemp. There had been plenty of other books written, um, and we and you know Jack details a lot of information from those books, um, but Jack did something that none of the other books really managed to do, and that was to inspire people to go out and get active in their communities to work towards legalizing hemp. So he became more of an author, uh, or he became not just an author, but more of an advocate and an activist um, in a really big way. So, um, so anyway, what, what's great about The Emperor Wears No Clothes is that Jack talks about a lot of the history, he goes back through the years and talks about um, historically, you know, 10,000 years ago, what was going on with hemp up through the 1930s, World War II, um, and, uh, and then he, he references everything. So 
in the back of the book, you can actually see the originals. You know, he's got a lot of the original books that his information came from. So not only is this a historic, this is like a treasure trove of reference material, this is the start of many, many rabbit holes that, um, that people can go down. See here we've got old uh, actual news articles. This one actually looks like, that's Popular Mechanics, um, Reader's Digest. So these are all uh, sort of, you know, it's almost like ancient history. You know, it's the Wall Street Journal, but it's like ancient history we were never taught. So, uh, so Jack does a really good job of putting together, and, and I should say he did a good job, so he's, he's no longer with us, but um, he did a really great job of bringing all that information together into one place that, that really did become, you know, like the original hemp Bible for, uh, for hempsters. So this one started a lot of sort of a revolution. Um, I also like hemp for victory for the same reason that I like the emperor wears no clothes. Oh, you know what? There's something I want to show you here. This particular copy, so I have two copies of this. This is the one, my sentimental copy. Um, when I ordered this, I, uh, I think I ordered it around the end of 2007. Uh, a good friend of mine, Paula, Pioneer Paula, hey. Um, she held this up in a meeting and said, you need to get a copy of this book. She told everybody at the meeting, you need to get a copy of this book and you need to read it. And, you know, so I remember that. And, and uh, so I went on eBay and I bought a copy of the book. And when I was looking on eBay, I was like, oh, well, I could pay like $10 more and get an autograph copy. So I went ahead and I forked over the extra $10 and I got an autographed copy. And, um, and when I got it, you know, it was like I opened the very first page and, and it kind of changed my world because even though he didn't write this to me in particular, I kind of almost felt like he did. And I don't know if you can read that, but it says, teach hemp to everyone. Jack Herrer. So here you go, Jack. <laughs> I've been doing that pretty much ever since. And um, I think about that, that little, that little uh, note there, teach hemp to everyone a lot. So um, this book, Hemp for Victory, is similar to The Emperor Wears No Clothes because uh, Kenyon Gibson is bringing together a lot of information and a lot of resources from a whole bunch of different places. Um, because it's a much newer book than The Emperor Wears No Clothes, there's a lot of good information in here that has been uh, brought, pulled together from different authors. Like, I think this book is referenced in this book. So, um, so there's a lot of really good information. And, and once again, there's the historical information. There's the plant physiology, uh, paper making, food, ropes, 25,000 other uses, which basically is another way to say plastic. Um, but then there's also some good, good reference material, just really good educational material that's included in the book, plant physiology, and just the very basics. Um, and that's the kind of information that it might be a little bit of an advanced read, but there's a lot of really good information in here for everybody. Um, let's see. I haven't thought too much about what, um, what books or what order I wanted to talk about them. But um, somebody asked me what is my favorite book on marijuana. What's your favorite right, so, book on marijuana? Oh, great question. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Um, my favorite book on marijuana is The Science of Marijuana by Dr. Leslie Iverson. I talk about this book a lot, and um, I, I always, always suggest that people, that legislators, that public officials, that people who make executive decisions in government, I always suggest this book to them. Um, I don't think there's too many legislators who've actually taken me up on this and have read this book, um, but I know several doctors, including my, my own doctor who did uh, surgery on my neck, read this book, and it's just fantastic. 
Um, the science of marijuana, I've got two different editions here. This is the first, uh, the second edition that was give, gifted to me. Um, and then after my surgeon read this one, he ordered himself a copy of this one because he was so impressed by the, the wealth of scientific data in this book. So when people say to you, and you hear this all the time, we don't have enough research on hemp, just share this book with them because it literally just pulls research from all over the globe, all over the country. Um, university research, federal government research, independent research, research from other countries' governments, all in one place, and it makes it any kind of, uh, almost, uh, he explains everything in a very easy way so that we can understand it without understanding, you know, without having to understand, um, you know, the high, high upper level pharmacology and physiology of the human body you know he kind of breaks everything down really really well so we have that's a, quick a question book. about those mm -hmm. uh, question? Roy Kelton Orbison would like to know where he can buy those educational books being in the Philippines well all any I, suggestions I know for sure that a lot of these books are on Amazon um, if they're on Amazon then they're almost certainly on Audible, uh, which I don't know if Amazon owns it or what, um, but Audible is the audiobooks. And uh, a lot of them are on both Amazon and Audible, or even Kindle, where you can actually get, you know, you download the book digitally and read it. Um, the Science of Marijuana, I know this is Oxford Press, so this actually came from Oxford University. I can almost guarantee that this one is, is somewhere on the Kindle or Audible or something that would allow you to download it worldwide as opposed to having to wait for the books. Um, but since it is Oxford Press and that's Oxford, the UK, um, it might be, they might be shipping internationally. I hope that answered your question. Um, if anybody else has questions, chime in. I just kind of wanted to, today to be a little bit more relaxed and maybe give you guys a chance to ask me some questions as well. Um, so let's see. The next one I will get into is Hemp for Health because I've, I held this one up already. Um, hemp for Health is written by Chris Conrad. Uh, and Chris is, is a, a hempster. He's been around for probably decades uh, teaching people about hemp. This one I have read so many times. I, I've really abused it. It's pretty beat up. But, um, so this one is from 1997 which kind of tells you how long Chris has been educating people. Um, he, he wrote this in 97, so I'm sure he was an advocate um, and a, probably an activist for hemp before that. Um, but what I like about this one, I like the way that he writes. It, he's a very casual writer, and um, you know, it's a, it's a very relaxing, comfortable read. You're not reading it and you know, having to reread the same paragraph five times because you didn't understand something that's technical maybe from the medical stuff or, you know, history stuff that's, that's kind of boring. Like he takes, he takes concepts and discussions and things and just makes them very interesting and easy to read. Um, so I really like this one. I've read it a few times. My children have also damaged <laughs> this plastic over, this plastic wrap here, but you can kind of see it's in good shape on the inside um, but very good book by Chris Conrad and Chris Conrad is still out there put beating the beating the doors and um, sort of um, just advocating and you know he, he's still out there doing great things for him Louie would like to know how you pronounce your last name <laughs> <It's> alphabet <laughs> alphabet um it's Arzamastseva, but I don't use it because nobody can say it, so Moyer is fine. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so going back through history, I guess, um, so both of these books are, are really uh, more historical. The, um, the Reign of Law, believe it or not, I actually have not read this whole thing, um, but it is a classic, and it's one of those things that... Um, you know, it's, it's kind of widely known in hemp circles as being this sort of romantic, um, sort of giving an idea. Like, he, he talks very beautifully. Oh, look at this. I have some 
him history in here. Um, he talks very beautifully about the um, hemp fields in Kentucky. And I will get back to that in just a minute. I just found this. Okay, this is really cool. So I found some old mail to me, Katie Moyer. I was hoping to find a date on here. It looks like maybe 2012. Um, this is cool. I don't know if it's real. Yeah, it's real. It's for real, real. Okay. I forgot that I even had this. What a beautiful thing to find. Kentucky's Famous Products. I don't know how you, well, you can see it, but it says a Kentucky hemp field up here. Over here is Kentucky Tobacco Field. Here is a Kentucky Bell because beautiful women are obviously a product of Kentucky. Um, and then we have a Hamburg bred in old Kentucky. So we've got our race horses. And then right here in the middle, I think that is none other than Kentucky bourbon. Could be no other thing. So what a cool thing to find. Let's look at the back of this. Um, what a neat thing. It actually says that this postcard was made in Germany. Uh, it says, Wren and King Publishers and Importers, Lexington, Kentucky, made in Germany. Awesome. Very cool. Well, what a cool thing to find in our little book, book club today. <laughs> it's, you would not believe how many things over the years I've picked up on eBay. Um, and then I tuck them away somewhere. And I don't, I don't know about it or I forget about it. It disappears down the memory hole, as I like to say. This book's also been signed by a lot of people. It says uh, 1900 and 1901. So I have another copy of this one, but uh, this is one of the old original copies. Very beautiful. I don't know if you can see this kind of pretty gold embossed. I don't know how well you can see that, but I have a, I have a reproduction of this that I use for actually reading. So this one just kind of stays up on the, the shelves. Um, and you know, I never read it because when I bought this, um, it was right before we started growing hemp in Kentucky. And I remember I started reading it and I was just in love with the way that he talked about, you know, the hemp fields blowing in the breeze and I could, I could like see the pollen fluffing out of the field and I could see them rippling in the wind. And it was just such a beautiful way of writing. And not long after that, so I wrote a little post, I think I posted a blog about something like this, about this book, um, back when I started reading it, and then uh, all of a sudden we started being able to grow hemp, and, and, uh, and my whole world changed, everything got really busy, and I just never finished it and never picked it back up, but now is probably a good time to do that since we're all quarantined. All right, so next book, A History of the Hemp Industry in Kentucky. So this one is also pretty well known in, in circles in Kentucky. Um, this is by James Hopkins, and, uh, and this is a University, University of Kentucky Press book. So th this is another one that's published by a university like this Oxford Press um, the Science of Marijuana, and typically when books get get printed through a university, they get a lot more notoriety, and so I think that's kind of the case here. Um, there's a, a whole series of historical books that come out of the University of Kentucky Press, um, but this particular one is copyrighted in 1951. So, um, A History of the Hemp Industry in Kentucky is a little bit more of a dry read, it's not, um, it's not something like, you know, it's not a story. It's not one of those edge of your seat kind of reads. It's, it's just, it's historical information, but the information is so good that it really does keep you intrigued by anything. So even though it's not, you know, a rip roaring tale of adventure, um, it's still interesting enough to where you don't want to put it down. But I will say there are times in this book that I was a little bored and I was kind of like, okay, let's stop reading data on how many bales of hemp fiber were produced in this county. Like, okay, I get it. Um, but once again, it, it's, you know, different types of reads for different things. So what, whatever it is you're looking for. Um, so um, I have two more books. So we're at 20 minutes now. Um, so I guess that's going on a little longer than what I was thinking. 
Um, but I don't really care if you don't care, so I'll just keep going. Um, I have two more books that I wanted to talk about, but because I brought up these books that were more historical, I think that um, there are a couple of historical books that you should know about that I don't have. Um, one of them, so um, one of them is a bluegrass, or it's the Bluegrass Conspiracy. And the Bluegrass Conspiracy is sort of one of those that it, it's not, it's not t talking about hemp too much. Might be some references to other cannabis in there. Um, but it's more of sort of like a grounding point where you can see how politically things happen in Kentucky. And um, Kentucky is known as like number two most corrupt state in the country after Illinois, which is obvious. Um, but it's not just because of, uh, you know, illegal corruption. It's because of legal corruption as well. And, um, so that, that's one of those things, the bluegrass conspiracy. And the only reason I really bring this up as it's a good book to read, check it out. Um, maybe we can get a link to it. Um, but I don't have a copy of it, but what I did have a copy of, and unfortunately a lot of my books disappeared over time when I loaned them to friends and I never saw them again. Um, but one of my, one of the books that I really did want to share with you is, um, is sort of, it's not a follow up to the bluegrass conspiracy, but it sort of goes in that same vein of how things operate in the boonies in Kentucky and the country and the hills. Um, and that is the cornbread mafia. So the cornbread mafia was written by a good friend of mine, Jim Higdon. And, uh, Jim and I have been working together on hemp issues since probably, I'm going to say 2012 or 13, uh, when we served on the Hemp Commission together. And uh, Jim wrote this book, The Cornbread Mafia. And The Cornbread Mafia is one of those that, um, it, it, it's like it makes you eat the whole book all at once. And so I always say, I, I'm not a bookworm, I, I'm a book eater. Like if I like a book, I will sit and I will finish it in two hours if I need to, or I will not sleep until I finish it because I can't. The Cornbread Mafia was one of those books that kept me up all night um, because I couldn't go to bed until I finished it. And I actually remember like passing out that night and, and I think it was like really, uh, who knows, but um, I just remember passing out and like waking up the next morning like, why am I getting my kid's <laughs> bed? Where, what is going on? Because I couldn't go to sleep until I finished this book. Um, but it, it was such, such a good book and I don't have a copy of it. I wish I did. Um, I believe that was one that I loaned out and never saw again. So Jim, send me another one. Autograph it. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Yep. This one, this one is so near and dear to my heart. I guess I saved it for a uh, second to last because this, this is the book that really, um, it changed my life. We got coloring pages from the kids. I thought maybe it was some awesome hemp history, but no, it's a it's a bunny coloring page. So perfect for hemp homeschool. <laughs> Must have been using it as a bookmark. Um, so this book, this is called The Last Free Man in America uh, meets the synthetic subversion. And uh, this was written, this is an autobiography that was written by Gatewood Galbraith. And Gatewood, um, he was a, a friend of mine, and uh, and he was he was definitely an inspiration to me. He is really the one I would say more so than Jack Herer and Woody Harrelson and Craig Lee. Um, Gatewood was really the one who inspired me to to get um, act, get active in hemp and and to work towards legalizing hemp. Um, he the first time I ever met him. Um, my, my mentor introduced me to him and he was like, Hey, I could tell we're kindred spirits. <laughs> and I was like, dude, thank you for saying that because, um, to be considered, you know, a kindred spirit to Gatewood is just a really beautiful thing. Um, but Gatewood was, he was considered a polarizing figure. Um, but I just think that, that, that is just such a oversimplified way of thinking about what Gatewood was as a political figure. 
Um, they, they said Gatewood was a polarizing figure because he supported marijuana and uh, supported hemp. He supported legalizing marijuana for medical reasons, for probably recreational reasons. He used marijuana. Um, but the, that was the issue that was polarizing. The issue of marijuana was polarizing. Gatewood was the opposite. He was like, he had um, beliefs that could pull in people from so many different political uh, affiliations and political networks. I mean, look at the front of this cover. So here's Gatewood holding a 50 caliber machine gun. He was a, a, a huge proponent of the Second Amendment and our ability to pr protect ourselves and our family using pretty much any any method at our disposable or at our disposal. Um, but he was a true Second Amendment um, uh, fighter, and and so he brought in to his his circle and the people who loved him. He was bringing in very conservative. Um, you know, sort of right-wing people that believed in the Second Amendment. But at the same time, Gatewood also believed that we needed to um, end a mountaintop removal completely in eastern Kentucky. So therefore, he's bringing in right-wing, you know, gun-toting, you know, awesome people like me. And then he's bringing in um, environmentalists from the other side, you know, the Sierra Club and, all, and environmental groups. And then on the other hand, on the other, other, other hand, um, he's bringing in um, progressives and liberals because he's talking about things like, you know, giving all Kentucky students um, their own laptop, at least their own laptop, or, um, you know, there are just all kinds of things. So he's bringing together people from all these different political ideolo ideologies. And, uh, you know, whenever people say Gatewood was a polarizing figure, I, I don't see it as that. I see Gatewood as like the center, the center hub of a top of a wheel with spokes going out in every direction. And then when he would push something, he had this ability to get people to work together. And, you know, people who wouldn't necessarily agree with each other on other issues. So, Gatewood was an absolute hero of mine. Um, he also was a really good friend of my mentor, Norm Davis. Um, Norm, uh, Norman Gatewood just means so much to me. Um, but he... Uh, he described Norm, my mentor, as... A, well, I'll read you the first little little bit from this book. So this is the chapter, uh, Me and Norman Davis. So Gatewood says, I truly believe it is an accurate statement that at some point in the past, someone acting in a governmental capacity pissed Norman Davis off. For every government official who has the pleasure to deal with Norman since then, I feel your pain. I like Norman Davis. Hell, I love Norman Davis, warts and all. He is the honoriest, savviest, don't give an inch, unpaid citizen watchdog I have ever met. He knows more about the legislator, the legislature, the legislators, and the legislation each session than most of their own leaders. And he's probably done more to keep taxes lower in this state than any other living citizen has. So I'll let you uh, check into this book maybe and read more about Norm Davis. Um, but, you know, you can see Gatewood really felt strongly about him. And Norm is the guy who introduced me to Gatewood. So I've uh, been a big fan. He also writes about Willie Nelson. His uh, friendship with Willie Nelson. His friendship with uh, Woody Harrelson. Um, shoot, there was one other thing. Well, it's all right. I guess we're getting getting somewhere on this video. So we're at 30 minutes. All right, while we're talking about <clears throat> while we're talking about um, rabble rousing, I figured I would bring uh, one of my favorite books. My mom will be proud of me for bringing this book to uh, book club today. But uh, but this is the this is the drug story by Morris Beale. This book if put in the hands of Americans all over the country, would incite a revolution.
buy it on eBay before it disappears forever because uh, there have been times that you could not get copies of this book. If there was ever a book to be burned in this country to protect the many at the top, this would be one of those books. Um, the Drug Story by Morris Beale. I don't know if you can get a good shot at that. <clears throat> so, um, The Drug Story was written, and let's see, this copyright is 1976, so copyright 1949. Um, this, this book, it, it really does read like, a, like a, a spy novel, almost, because you're like, oh man, this is an exciting adventure of, uh, you know, subversion and political sabotage and, and sabotage in the medical industry, and oh my god, what is the FDA doing, that you think, wow, what a great story. And then what's scary about it is then you realize that it's real. It's 100% real. And that these things have been going on since the 30s and the 40s and since the development of the American Medical Association and since the, the creation of the FDA. Um, so, I mean, th this book, it's something to look into. Essentially, it talks about uh, what Morris calls the drug trust, which is this sort of un unholy alliance between the American Medical Association and the FDA and how they use their strength and their network to demonize any kind of natural healing, chiropractic care, osteopathy, um, herbalism, uh, and, and really force everybody to do one of three things, which is um, radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery. And if one of those three things can't fix it, we'll then throw some pills at it. So um, <clears throat> I won't go too much further into this one because there's already black helicopters flying around. <laughs> but uh, there Don't literally die. is. No. Like there is a black helicopter right over there. <clears throat> it's okay. We live near Fort Campbell. They're always flying around. Um, but anyway, so that's it. Um, if anybody has any questions about any books or wants more links or anything like that, um, holler at us. We're happy to share. I enjoyed hanging out with everybody today and thank you for listening and thank